Welcome to the Education and Empowerment Podcast. In this show, our hosts explore success and advancement through education by interviewing today's top leaders in the fields of education, business, and technology in order to provide insight into what it really takes to succeed. This show is brought to you by Forstay, a SaaS-enabled online booking marketplace for student and intern housing. Forstay provides turnkey, all-in-one, cloud-based accommodation software solutions for colleges, universities, and organizations. Learn more at offcampus.forstay.com and landlords.forstay.com. All right, let's get into the show. Hello, and welcome to the Education and Empowerment Podcast. This is Bakhtiar Soyev, your host for the show. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Jennifer Clinton. Dr. Jennifer Clinton, welcome to our show. Greetings. Good afternoon. It's great to be here. Thanks for, thanks for having me. Thank you so much. We're very honored to be speaking with you today. It's exciting times, and, and you know, certainly people like you have uh, a bright sense of you know where the world is going and what can we do collaboratively to be proactive. And I hope that this episode will give our listeners a good understanding of the topics that you know we're going to explore. And as a first question, I wanted to get a little bit of better sense of how did you get into the field of international education and exchanges and youth empowerment. Great, thanks. So it sort of goes way back, I think about what um, led me to this field. And I I have to pinpoint to just kind of my upbringing. And I grew up outside of Detroit, Michigan, and spent most of my summers up until I was about 17, traveling over to Canada. My grandparents had a summer cottage there. And I remember those kind of early days of being really fascinated with, you know, the differences, though not very stark between the U.S. and Canada, and I, you know, the early exposure I had to the French language and Canadian culture really gave me the appetite to continue to explore different cultures and be a bridge builder. So from there, you know, I I studied French in high school, and then as an undergraduate student, I pursued, you know, an undergrad degree in French literature, and then pursued a PhD in French literature with really the aim of helping young people explore the Francophone world, because that was my first exposure to foreign language. And then I was lucky during both my undergrad and graduate studies to both study and work abroad. And both of those experiences, I would say, were really instrumental in shaping my commitment to providing both study abroad and experiential learning opportunities for young people to explore different cultures and languages through exchange programs. And so I've just been, you know, working the last 25 years in this field, and it really just brings me a lot of of pleasure and, you know, being able to kind of pay it forward to all those who helped me expand my horizons through international education and exchange. That's amazing. That's great to hear. I mean, in, you know, what, what you see these days, obviously travel is a little bit restricted right now, but, you know, we, what I see by talking to so many uh, people like yourself is that there's so much commitment and so much positivity about the future. And one of the things we wanted to explore as we move forward is, you know, what is this student success outside of classroom mean to people? So I was hoping that maybe you can elaborate a little bit about you know, and as you mentioned, you know, when you were 17, that this is kind of where it all began. So you were young and you had maybe your own understanding of like what it means to be successful. And then as you, you know, went ahead, perhaps, you know, your thesis of, you know, student success changed. But do you want to elaborate a little bit about, you know, what does uh, student success mean to you as uh, someone working in the field of international education and exchanges? Sure. That's a great question. I like to take a very holistic view of student success and think about it in kind of three categories that are all intertwined, starting with the personal, you know, what what is from like success look like from a personal perspective and then academic and then professional. And, you know, really it all starts with kind of what drives an individual and what motivates one. And I, I, I think about from a personal standpoint, student success being really about identifying that internal compass. What is one's values? What do you stand for? Who are you? What do you want to accomplish in your career and in your life? And so, you know, I think about being in the, involved in the, the realm of education, that being a major responsibility of all educators to, to really help 
young people develop that internal compass because everything in my mind flows from that. So, you know, success as a, as a student, as in the academic world, flows from, you know, what, what is it that you're interested in? What motivates you that leads to a choice in your major, what it is that you're studying that should be aligned with that internal compass. And then, you know, success, then the academic success would lead to your professional success. And, you know, I look at young people today who have so many choices in front of them, and it can be really, really confusing as to how to make good choices, whether it's, you know, a major, whether it's what you're going to watch on TV tonight, it's just like inundated with so many different things. And, you know, as a personal example, I remember as a young person being really interested in languages and the choices I had were Spanish, French, and German. And now young people have, you know, 20 different language choices, so many different opportunities to study work, in turn, travel abroad, to many different countries. My choices were basically Italy, France, England, you know, just very, very limited. And so I think that overload of choices is really causing a lot of anxiety for young people and them maybe not feeling as equipped as to how to make good choices. And so I, again, it kind of goes back to the role of educators is, you know, certainly helping them be successful in all of those realms, but helping them really understand and build that sense of self and that internal compass to be able to make good choices and in, in whatever realms, personal, professional, and academic they're, they're facing. That's great. That's great. And what would you say are the critical components of uh, student success outside of classroom? You know, you, you mentioned about experiences, but are there specific activities or are there any pieces of the puzzle that you find most critical for making young people successful? And if they are, what would they be? Yeah, so I think the, the most important elements are opportunities that provide, you know, different experiences. So like hands-on experiences, and that's, and that's why I've chosen to be in the field of experiential education, because I think it's the most powerful element of kind of test driving what your interests are, what your passions are, what your academic um, pursuits are. So things like volunteering, things like internship experiences, uh, work experiences, it could be just like summer job experiences, your after school jobs, travel experiences, your living experiences, you know, where, who do you choose to live with? Where do you choose to live? All of those opportunities provide that okay, kind of sort of force you to test out uh, your values, what you believe in, what you stand for. And the more that, of that testing that we can provide to young people to really yeah, help them hone, make better choices, but also hone that internal compass, I, I think is, is so, so valuable. And, and I often find young people really kind of reticent to, to make wrong choices. And I think these, the opportunities that I laid out it should all be all about, you know, it's okay to try something and not like it. That's the best way to help you make good decisions. And so being, being able to do a lot of different things and test out a lot of different things early on, right. I think will help people be more successful later, later in life. That's great. That's great. And, you know, when, when I was talking to uh, several other professionals, you know, in the field of uh, student affairs and people who run, you know, career programs and kind of, you know, career development at institutions, one of the thoughts that, you know, they, they gave is the fact that, you know, career planning and, and success, you know, work starts early on, not, not even before you kind of get into, you know, your, your college. And, and we talked a lot about the, the different, you know, challenges that, you know, the industry is facing right now. And, you know, our podcast listeners being both young people as well as professionals working in the field, I was hoping that maybe you can shed some light into what challenges do you see working with young people? I mean, you mentioned specific items like, you know, work experiences, or, you know, travel experiences, but, you know, do you see any challenges in the, in the work these days? So what, I mean, I work with a lot of young people, both within my organization, but that's what we focus on is working with young people. And I think there's a few things, a few challenges that come up often is a little bit around 
sort of expectation management, because as I talked earlier about, you know, there's this overwhelming need to make the right choices and the feeling of pressure that, you know, in, in a in a like a first job out of college, there's a sense of like this has to be like the perfect thing for me. And if I'm not succeeding, you know, quickly enough, then it was the wrong choice or I'm not good enough. I mean, I think helping young people understand how to be patient and that, you know, the first one or two jobs after your undergraduate career or your undergraduate studies, it, it's all a process and a part of a longer journey. And I think that's challenging that seeing the, the long picture for people to help, you know, just helping them have that patience, manage expectations around where they should be or need to be at certain points in their careers. I think the other aspect that is putting a lot of pressure on young people is just, you know, the, the cost of higher education in the United States. Right. I think it puts a lot of pressure on students to not necessarily listen to that internal compass because of the financial obligations that they have. And so they feel like, you know, as once they graduate, there's a lot of financial pressure to, you know, make a high earning salary so that they can pay back the debt. Right. That choice may not be the best choice for them. So I'll just give my own experience. I was, you know, so fortunate to earn a um, athletic scholarship from my undergraduate studies. So I, when I graduated, I didn't have any college debt, and I was was very unique in that. And that gave me the ability to kind of follow my own internal passions and pursue a PhD in French literature, where I knew number one, I wasn't going to make wasn't going to make very much money off the bat, I was going to be in school for a long time. And two, it, it wasn't all this pressure for me to, you know, you know, start making a lot of money to, to pay back that debt, I could actually pursue something that I was really passionate about. So right. I, you know, I, I think that's a big challenge today. And we've got to figure out how we can, you know, reduce that level of pressure to help people make you know, choices that are aligned with their value system so that, you know, later on down the road, they don't find themselves in a situation where they're just, you know, they're unhappy because they, they chose a route that helped them pay back their student debt versus choosing a route that was really going to make them a whole person and a happy, fulfilled person. That's great. That's great. And you mentioned, you know, about these challenges, and I was hoping that maybe you could, you know, explain what uh, Cultural Vistas does and um, how perhaps some of these challenges are now being tackled by, you know, professionals like yourself and your team. And what are some of the perhaps exciting programs and opportunities that people can take advantage of through Cultural Vistas? Thanks for that question. So we're a nonprofit organization that focuses on providing experiential uh, opportunities in, an, in a sort of a global context for young people, young people meaning undergraduate students all the way up to people who are kind of mid-career. And our intent is to help individuals have these global experiences to both build their global skills and competencies for what is very much a global workplace, but also to help them you know, move into the world where they they can feel a commitment to kind of help be a help solve you know some of the the world's most pressing challenges so it's it's really about building careers but also helping to build societies through experiential exchange programs and so we i see our our role as kind of sitting alongside higher education who is very much focused on sort of the classroom learning and our programs are complementary to that to let you know, emerging leaders test out their careers and kind of test out their passions and ambitions in a global context. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. And, and you know, what uh, fascinates me is, you know, as we're talking about, you know, work around, you know, success outside of classroom and empowering young people, your work at Cultural Vistas does exactly that, you know, because, you know, most of the programs that you have is, as you said, is that, you know, they not only complementary to the academic portion of it, but also the experiential learning where, you know, they get to actually do things. On that note, is there, you know, any one or two programs that you're very proud of at Cultural Vistas that has a significant impact. Can you share that success story with us? Sure, there's, there's a lot. I mean, I'll take one of our flagship programs that we've been doing for 
over 30 years is our Congress Bundestag Youth Exchange Program. That's a partnership between the U.S. government and the uh, German government with the intent of really kind of building out the next generation of both U.S. and German transatlanticists who are, are really helping to forge the relationship between the U.S. and Germany. And that program provides language learning. So, so it's a year-long program for undergraduate, graduate students that provides language learning, so full immersion and learning either English or German. It's a two-way exchange program. So 75 Americans go to Germany, 75 Germans come to the U.S. to do language learning, academic studies, and a work experience. So you talk about all the things that, you know, helps build success. Right. I think that program really speaks to it. And, you know, as I look at, they interacted with a lot of alumni from that program. And what I can say is huge dedication to advancing this, you know, U.S. German relationship. You know, it, it comes through and who they are and what they're doing in their careers, but also in their lives today. And, you know, these, these individuals are just are very much about not only, you know, kind of building their, their careers, but also playing a larger role in society of, you know, just, just, doing good. So I'll take an example of, you know, one of our alums who I think is, is really a testament to the type of people that participate in this program, Elena Percival, who's, who started a nonprofit organization several years ago called Women Who Code. She's, you know, she's connecting women all over the world who are in the IT space and the coding space and really lifting them up and bringing more women into the, the IT world and connecting them with companies who, you know, would really benefit from having more, more women in that field. And it's just, you know, she's a perfect example of somebody who took advantage of this experience and now is giving back to really the global community and helping others both build their careers, but also do so in a way that is helping society. That's awesome. I really heard about the Women Who Code nonprofit organization. I didn't know she's an alumni of this program. Congratulations. I mean, there's certainly, you know, programs that Cultural Vistas is leading that, you know, everyone is excited about. And one of the things that, you know, 2021 is, is giving us is the hope that things like 2020 not going to happen. If you were to take yourself back to 2020 and how the whole, you know, pandemic hit us, what are the some of the like insights or the lessons learned or what have you noticed you know in in your industry specifically how has your work changed and were these programs that you mentioned affected i mean did you see any change in the successes of these programs i'd be curious to know so many lessons learned over the last year i mean i think the biggest one that we've all learned is just the flexibility and adaptability and just reimagining and giving ourselves time and space to, but not too much time and space, because, you know, you got to be adaptable to really kind of think about like, what's our role? And I think us, Cultural Vistos as an organization, you know, had, had really emphasized mobility and moving people around and spending so much time and energy on getting that right, like getting sort of perfected of finding the, the best host families so somebody could have a good living situation finding the best partners that would that would help people when they when they move to another country and when that when you take that mobility away it really sheds a light on you know what what actually what learning is actually happening and you can you can pivot your your staff and the energy that you're spending from moving from sort of a logistical management to now learning management and community building and that's something that, you know, we, we had to make a big, big adjustment in this past year of really focusing on student experience. And we, we, sh we shifted a lot of our programs that were, you know, mobility programs to all virtual programs and cross-cultural virtual programs. And you would think, well, how, you know, how do you do that? But, you know, we found a multitude of ways from having students work virtually, so virtual international internships if you will, to a lot of virtual convenings and community building and learning within groups about other cultures and having more discussion that is reflective versus immersive. And, you know, the outcomes, they're different, but I think 
can be and have been proven to be pretty powerful. Fantastic. Yeah, that's great. No, I, and I think I've been hearing similar stories on also the, you know, importance of, you know, community building, you know, looking at, you know, the industry that you're working in through the lenses of partnerships and collaboration rather than competition. And a lot of the conversations, you know, we're having at the Education and Empowerment Podcast is to educate and empower people um, and organizations and, you know, communities and, and companies to be proactive and, and look to the future and continue the great work that we all have been doing. So, with that note, I was hoping that maybe you could tell us a little bit more about, you know, what's the future like? You know, what are some of the things we can do together today to prepare for that better future? Like, how, how can we innovate the field? What's important for us? Yeah, I think to your point, the the notion of partnership is really, really important because we're all being being, you know, called to reimagine what what our kind of industries look like. And I, you know, I think about, you know, we've been working with Force Day for a number of years. And I think about your role as a, as a company and providing a very important aspect of one's success. And, you know, how, how might our two organizations, just as an example, think right. about it differently that goes beyond we're putting good people in good places and good living experiences to how are we actually helping curate that experience so that it leads to student success? How might we as two organizations that really care about this put our heads together and you know utilize, for example, your, your expertise around technology? I mean, we're a nonprofit organization that is has been focused on education. We're not a tech company. And, you know, there are instances where we are actually working together. We're bringing your technological expertise to the table and we marry that with the educational aspect. And that can be a very powerful win-win situation. And I think we've got to see more and more of that because, you know, we're not going to become a tech company, but technology is going to drive so much of our future. And so to be find and you know build on partnerships in new ways I think is going to be that is going to be a critical element to success going forward none of us can can really go it alone in this new world and there's data to that too I mean when you look at higher education and and you know last year's you know situation with coronavirus over 83 percent of uh, a survey that was conducted 83 percent of university presidents confirmed that they are outsourcing and partnering with you know third-party companies to carry on to things like student services you know housing and you know auxiliary services and and other things because those are kind of the most kind of expensive ones for an institution to run and sustainability was kind of the big question that everyone started exploring like how can we minimize our costs and you know one of the things that we're excited at force day as you mentioned is you know partnering with institutions like yours you know where we provide you know on and off campus housing you know cloud based technology and and data to help make decisions and for institutions like yours to continue doing what you do great. I mean, we're not going to be a nonprofit and you're not going to be a technology company. I think that's that's what it well said. And the whole world is like a big startup now, right? You know, there's so much going on. And I think you shared some very great examples. And I think it's a very positive note to actually, you know, conclude our episode. And I appreciate your time. And as we kind of wrap this up i was hoping that you could leave us with a, a piece of wisdom or any quote around education or empowering young people or student success yeah so it's actually a quote that came out in an article in inside higher education last year i'm thinking back to april and i'll just read it because i think it really speaks to kind of what we've been talking about is uh, the, the original quotes from thoreau the writer, the frontiers are not east or west, north or south, but wherever a man or person fronts a fact. In the spirit, I suggest that we no longer define education abroad strictly as students literally crossing national borders. Rather, we should conceive of it as an educational framework that promotes the mobility of students' minds, minds engaged in confronting other cultures and worldviews that help overcome their biases. 
education abroad has always been used, has always used geography as a point of definition, but now we've begun to view it as an educational model that can be practiced in a wider variety of forms. And to that point, I think, you know, kind of bringing back the notion of technology, that's kind of the, where this intersection of a broadened sense of mobility, sort of the mobility of a, of a mind, the best way that that's going to be achieved is through technology. And so I'm really hopeful about the future. And, you know, there's so much great work happening both in the education sector and then in the technology sector and the ed tech sector that, you know, it's, there's sort of possibilities are limitless. It's just a matter of kind of opening up our minds to getting, getting rid of some of the borders that we've been focused on crossing and envision new kinds of borders. So. That's a great inspiration. Dr. Jennifer Clinton, thank you so much for your time. It's been certainly amazing. I mean, your story and, you know, the work that you do at Cultural Vistas. We, on behalf of Four State Team, you know, we appreciate your time and we hope that our listeners will find them inspirational. For all the listeners out there, please make sure you subscribe to our podcast on podcast.forstay.com so you never miss an episode. Once again, thanks for Force Day for sponsoring this episode and this podcast. If you're curious about what Force Day does and the services we provide for different organizations, companies, and educational institutions, check us out at podcast.forceday.com or forceday.com. And until next show, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Thank you. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of the Education and Empowerment Podcast. This show is brought to you by Forstay, a SaaS-enabled online booking marketplace for student and intern housing. Forstay provides turnkey, all-in-one, cloud-based accommodation software solutions for colleges, universities, and organizations. Learn more at offcampus.forstay.com and landlords.forstay.com.